Hi, everybody. My name is Egan Anderson, and I'm the head of developer experience at Galileo. Before my developer experience role, I was a developer. I actually uh, studied computer science at the University of Utah and uh, worked as a mobile developer, a mobile software developer before this. Um, a little bit about Galileo. Uh, Galileo is the API standard for card issuing and digital banking. Um, so what that means is we provide the, uh, the banking infrastructure for a lot of the popular fintechs today, like Robinhood, Chime, Monzo, and TransferWise. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to build a developer-first product. And, and I'm mostly going to be focusing on the fundamentals uh, that, that every team can focus on to be able to improve their, uh, their developer product. So before I dive into it, I, I kind of want to call out, you know, when I think of developer experience, I think of, uh, you know, companies like Stripe, uh, you know, who has an incredible developer experience, but it, it, it kind of sets almost an impossibly high standard because they are so good and they're, you know, they're doing so many different things that when I look at a company like Stripe, it's hard to narrow in on what are the most important things for Galileo to be doing? Like, what are the, you know, what are the most important parts of Stripe's approach that, that we can apply. So I, one example, they, uh, Stripe has Increment Magazine, which is a, it's a developer magazine that they send out every month. It is beautifully designed. It covers a range of topics from uh, documentation to programming languages to open source. And it's really popular among you know, Stripe's developer community and uh, it's a really good thing for them. But it works for them because they have the fundamentals down. And uh, I think it maybe it probably wouldn't make sense for Galileo to be doing, you know, something like this. And maybe for a lot of you, it, it would make more sense to uh, to first spend time really nailing down the fundamentals. Another great example is Twilio, uh, you know, possibly the most beloved you know, developer company out there. They recently released a video game called Twilio Quest. The tagline is learn to code and lead your intrepid crew on a mission to save the cloud and Twilio Quest, a PC role playing game inspired by classics of the 16 bit era. So this is amazing and developers love it. And it's a great way to uh, to learn how to use Twilio's API. You, you literally have this little character who runs around Twilio world, I guess, and uh, and, you know, has to. Um, make API calls to free the princess or, you know, do whatever it is. And, you know, that it, it's awesome. But again, it probably doesn't make sense for most of us to dive in and do something like this until until we've really mastered the, the fundamentals of building a developer facing product. Another example is these giant developer conferences. WWDC is a really popular one by Apple that they do every year. They, I think they have something like 6,000 developers who attend and it lasts a whole week and there's keynotes and breakout sessions. Uh, and it, you know, it's, I, I can't imagine how uh, expensive it is to put on first of all, but uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's really an incredible way that they build their developer community. But again, they're able to do these kinds of things because they've mastered the fundamentals already. And so I think for a lot of us, these initiatives are, are a little bit out of reach and rightly so, because as I've already mentioned a few times, I, I, think, uh, I think most of us would be better served uh, doubling down on the fundamentals of building a developer facing product uh, before venturing into some of this other more expensive and more experimental territory. So I've already said the word fundamentals probably 15 times. Um, but I'm going to say it one more. So the, the fundamentals are, uh, you know, the things that any company can do to improve their developer experience. The word fundamental is also used in sports a lot. Like, I, you know, I remember in Little League Baseball, uh, learning the fundamentals of baseball. But the cool thing is that they still teach the fundamentals even to Major League Baseball players. So I think, that, you know, the important thing about, about fundamentals is they apply to all companies, big and small. Uh, and I, I think that the, the things that I talk about in the next 20 minutes are as applicable uh, to a tiny startup that's just barely rolling out their first developer facing product. Uh, you know, it's as important to them as it is to, uh, you know, the Stripes and Twilio's and Apple's who, who have been doing this for a long time and have these, uh, these really extravagant and robust developer strategies. 
So the first one, and the most important, in my opinion, is that there you have to advocate for developers in your company. And when I hear the word advocate, my mind, you know, it, it automatically jumps to developer advocate just because that's an industry term. It has the word ad, advocate in it. Um, but there's actually a lot of advocates inside of, of any company um, who are fighting for certain agendas and, and are, you know, are, are trying to uh, push certain things forward uh, within your product. And I'll give you a couple examples. The, the first is, you know, the CFO who is advocating for affordability. CFO's number one concern uh, in regards to a product is, is making sure that it's affordable. And a premium developer experience, it can require um, additional staffing. It can require, uh, you know, additional product loops and longer product loops. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, it makes the product more expensive to develop and maintain, which really puts it at odds with, with affordability. And so if the CFO has a say in the product and, and nobody's advocating for the developers, you know, you're going to have an affordability first product that has a really poor developer experience. Another example is the CTO. You know, these two maybe align a little bit better than the CFO and, and the, uh, the developer advocate. But still, a CTO advocates for simplicity and ease of engineering, right? The, the CTO wants the product to be easy to build and easy to maintain. And in cases where a premium developer experience calls for support across various platforms and programming languages, you know, that's not exactly simple to build and maintain. And so that that could maybe put the developer experience at odds with, with the CTO's agenda. A relationship manager just wants the existing clients to be happy and uh, and existing clients, you know, they're going to they're going to resist any type of changes to the product you know, whether those changes are making the developer experience better or not, if it requires uh, the existing client to uh, dive back into their code that they've mostly forgotten about and make changes and, and update things to work with, you know, the newest version of the API, uh, a lot of times they're not going to be happy about that. And so the relationship manager could push back against the developer advocate to try to, uh, you know, prevent a lot of these changes from happening that maybe would improve the, the developer experience. And then this is my favorite example, a security architect, uh, you know, if, if they had their way, um, the perfect API is one that has three factor authentication before allowing somebody uh, to, to even see the documentation. Right. I mean, the security architects, they, they want everything to be locked down. There's no chance of fraud happening. Uh, you know, none of the bad guys are able to get in and see the how the API works, um, which is the exact opposite of how a developer first product should work. Right. A developer first product should be transparent uh, and, and should allow the developer in to, you know, do a quick start and get their feet wet and start to experience how the product works, you know, before signing on to any any real commitment um, so that those two are definitely at odds with each other and so the the point here is that uh, it's it's so important that there's somebody advocating for the agenda of your developers because there's there's definitely a lot of other advocates in the room who are going to be advocating for for different agendas um, so it's very very important that you're uh, developers are being considered during these product conversations. And I'm not saying that you need to go out and hire a new person. I know a lot of companies have full-time developer advocates, um, and I'm not necessarily suggesting that you need that. Uh, you know, this could maybe be a technical writer or a PM or even a developer um, who, you know, is involved in these um, kind of product meetings and is able to advocate for the developer in, in those settings. The next uh, fundamental is to be consistent. So this is actually, you know, how the product should work. So you might recognize this as an oddly satisfying video. And I think it's funny how uh, hashtag oddly satisfying is kind of taken over the Internet. It's taken over social media. There's countless videos like this that people just obsess over because it's so fun to watch something that just it just works. You know, it, it runs smoothly. Everything fits perfectly. Uh, and, and, you know, really, this is exactly 
what a developer is looking for in a product. It, you know, they're looking for something that's oddly satisfying. The opposite of, of oddly satisfying is oddly unsatisfying. This is what you call something that's so close and yet so far, um, something that uh, you know looks like it could work, but it doesn't. Uh, and this is the bane of a developer's experience, right? A product that is is so close yet so far that looks like it should, you know, do something some way, but it doesn't. Uh, that's that's exactly what we want to avoid here. I was on site with a client uh, a couple months ago talking about. Um, well, I was talking with one of their developers about things that we could do to enhance our developer experience. And I was kind of talking about some of the moonshots that, uh, you know, that we started out with at the beginning. I was talking about, wouldn't it be cool if we did big conferences? And what if we rolled out a new command line interface or started an ambassador program? All these really, uh, you know, big, uh, big ambitions. And the developer responded and said, that stuff is great. But to be honest, the two things that developers care about most are consistency and reliability. And unless you have those, that other stuff doesn't really matter. Um, so, I mean, consistency means that the product is uniform and predictable. If you know how to use one piece of the product, you know how to use the whole thing. And reliability means that it does what it's expected to do every time. You know, the same way that this picture or that this, uh, this video, it, it just, it just works, you know, exactly the way that you would expect it to, and uh, and and it works every time, and it runs so smoothly, and things just fit where they're supposed to fit. And I'm convinced that you know the same endorphins that your brain is releasing right now watching this video, uh, those same endorphins are released when a developer uses a product that just works and is well documented, and it's consistent and reliable. So the third major thing uh, when creating a developer first pro product is it's so important to get feedback. So there's a movie called The Field of Dreams, which I've actually never seen. So I'm probably going to butcher this description. But uh, my understanding is that a, a ghost tells Kevin Costner that if he builds a baseball diamond in the middle of his cornfield, that uh, that a bunch of baseball ghosts will come and play baseball at his cornfield baseball diamond. Um, so please, uh, let me, if you've seen the movie, let me know if that's if that's wrong. Um, but the famous quote from this movie is, you know, what the ghost whispers into his ear as he's walking through the cornfield. It says, "If you build it, they will come." Yeah, it's a famous quote. Now I've seen it in a lot of memes, for example. Um, and a lot of companies seem to have this same mantra that if they build the product, of course, people will want to use it. You know, if, if you build it, they will come, they'll love it, uh, which is exactly the wrong approach. The, the correct approach is to talk to developers at every stage of the product's life cycle. Before we built our newest product, Galileo Instant, we wanted to get developer feedback on it. And so we... Um, what we did was we wrote the documentation before we wrote a single line of code. So we documented exactly how we envisioned the API working and how it would be structured. Uh, so we, we documented that as, as if it existed and sent it out to developers um, in our community to try to get some feedback on it. And it was almost overwhelming, the, the, the feedback we got. It was amazing. And, you know, we learned so many different things about uh, how developers intended to use it and that, you know, maybe the way that we had designed certain aspects weren't ideal for the way that developers, you know, actually uh, wanted to use the product. And so it, it ended up completely changing. And if you look at the product, um, you know, just released, and if you look at uh, the API today and compare it to that original API documentation that we created a, a few months ago, it looks like a totally different product, which is amazing and exactly what we wanted. Um, you know, we really let the developers in our community help build that product. And so that's why I've changed the, the name of that quote to uh, if they build it, they will come because you really want your developers to help build your product at every stage. Related to that is surveys. So, I mean, you're definitely going to get a lot of feedback through your traditional communication channels, but a lot of times you'll get the yearbook answers, right? Uh, your your developers will tell you, 
I mean, th this is a this is a real quote from a yearbook that I Googled, uh, you know, funny yearbook signatures, and this is what came up. So I assume it's real. But it says, uh, you're a really nice and chill person. Hope we'll have classes together next year in high school. Have a good summer. And I think that, you know, the equivalent of what you might receive from a developer is we we really like your API. And although the documentation isn't perfect, uh, we were able to build a great product. And while that might be true, it's like very superficial and, it, you know, it, it's hard to really uh, dig into what that means and, and turn that into actionable feedback. And so sometimes, you know, if you if you're looking for the hard answers, you have to ask the hard questions. So, you know, we like to send out surveys and ask questions like which part of your implementation was more difficult than it needed to be. And with that type of question, you can't really beat around the bush and offer a yearbook answer. You, you have to you have to just dig into it like and, and answer truthfully. Uh, you know, what Galileo can do to improve. Another example is which of the following improvements would have helped you the most during your implementation with a, you know, a list of a couple of things that we're thinking about updating and, and figure out which one is the most important to your developers. And so the key here is that you, you can't be afraid of honest, critical feedback. And in fact, you should, you should seek it out uh, at, at any possible opportunity. So the next thing you can do is uh, sponsor hackathons. And not only are hackathons a fun way to engage with the developer community, but it's also a, a great way to get developer feedback on your product. Galileo primarily sponsors two types of hackathons. The first one is a, uh, you know, hackathons at our local university. And we do that primarily for recruiting reasons to hire the developers who, who attend that hackathon. Um, the second type is an industry specific hackathon. So in our case, it's, uh, you know, fintech hackathons. And we sponsor those to get our product into the hands of the developers who are actually going to, you know, use Galileo. Um, but in both cases, it's super valuable for us to be able to see how developers are using the product. And, uh, so what we do is we, we host an API challenge. That means that uh, we award a prize to the team that comes up with the best project that uses Galileo's API. And then we get to watch live in person as uh, as these different teams um, as they they use our product. And so uh, we literally get to see them land on Galileo's corporate website and then navigate over to the to the developer tab and click on our documentation. We watch them go through the quick start guide. Um, and kind of peruse through the documentation for the first time, which you, you really can't get that experience anywhere else. So what it does for us is it allows us to figure out what questions uh, we never get asked. There's something called the 15 minute rule. That's a it's a popular practice with developers. And it, it means that you don't ask a question until you've uh, kind of been at it for 15 minutes. Um, and then additionally, you don't want to go beyond 15 minutes. If you've spent 15 minutes on a question, then it's time to just ask somebody and get unblocked. Uh, but what that means is a lot of times there could be things in our documentation that aren't clear, but maybe it's not a 15 minute, uh, problem. It, you know, maybe it's just a five or a 10 minute problem that they, you know, something's unclear. They Google it and they're able to find an answer or, or, you know, uh, they're able to talk to somebody who, who's maybe a little bit more familiar and get an answer. But a lot of those smaller questions never percolate up to Galileo. And so a hackathon is, is a, a great time to you know, figure out those smaller questions, the five minute or 10 minute questions, which are also very important to address. And you can see what roadblocks the developers run into large and small. So the, the fourth fundamental is, you know, how important it is to communicate. And the, the first part of that is, is documentation. Last week, I, uh, I FaceTimed my dad and uh, was talking to him about work. And he asked me, are you still writing the instruction manual for that company? And you could tell he was like a little bit like dissatisfied maybe with with my uh, career trajectory like you know i think when i was younger he thought i was going to be a doctor or a lawyer and now i'm you know the guy who writes instruction manuals uh you know as far as he's concerned 
which I, I thought was funny, but I, you know, I actually think it's so fulfilling and I, you know, I, I love my job, but I also like that analogy that, uh, you know, documentation, it, it's really just an instruction manual and the simpler you can make it, the better you want to make it very intuitive. And, you know, in Ikea's case, they don't even, uh, they don't even use words to explain how to build their products because they've, they've mastered the instruction manual and made it so simple. And so I think this goes back to, um, you know, what we were talking about, about creating an oddly satisfying product. I think you also want to have oddly satisfying documentation that it, it just works. Everything fits together. It's very reliable. Things uh, are consistent across the board and it requires a lot of iteration to get to that point. Right. You have to learn developer pain points and then enhance the documentation to address those those pain points. Uh, and, and that just keeps going and going. It's a very iterative process. Forums are, are definitely related. It's, it's impossible to answer every question in the documentation because some questions are gonna be uh, nuanced or in some way they're gonna be specific to a particular use case. Um, and so it doesn't make sense to, to you know, call out um, every single use case in the documentation. In those cases, it, it probably makes sense to answer those questions in a forum. And so the, the forum, I mean, after people, you know, ask their questions and, and then you go in and answer those questions, it really it provides another resource that developers can use. It's like a, a FAQ of sorts um, where developers can find the answers that they need that are maybe a little bit more nuanced than what they would find in the documentation. Uh, Stack Overflow is, you know, is kind of the gold standard of, of developer forums. You know, a lot of smaller companies their their questions don't end up in Stack Overflow. I, I don't think Galileo has ever been mentioned in Stack Overflow, for example, just because it's a, a pretty niche developer community that uses Galileo. Um, and so in a lot of cases, it uh, it makes sense to embed a forum within your own documentation or support page. Um, and so this is a screenshot actually from Tribe, which is a forum as a service provider that uh, that you could use to embed a forum within your site. It's very important to provide support to your developers. You know, a, a developer's nightmare is that a site doesn't give any information that they're looking for, doesn't give them access to, you know, documentation, for example, and instead requires them to input their email and name and uh, wait for somebody to contact them and show them a demo. If that's the strategy, you know, the barrier of communication is going to be too high for a lot of developers. Uh, who may otherwise want to use your product. Um, and similarly, if, you know, once a developer is using your product, if the only way to get questions answered is to go through a formal process, um, you know, that can take a couple of days and a JIRA tickets created and passed around to a few people before, you know, that question's answered, uh, you're going to have some unhappy developers. And so it, it's very important that we meet developers where they are and remove any of those communication barriers as much as possible. And even if, you know, we can uh, send them a note that says, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure uh, how that works. Let me look into it. Um, but, but you've started that line of communication. You're being open about things. And, you know, developers are really going to respond well to that. So one thing that we've been experimenting with at Galileo is a Discord server. And we have three administrators who make sure that every question is answered in a timely manner. Uh, and so far, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, so th this is actually a real message from uh, from a developer that I'm showing here. Um, he said, love that you have this Discord channel and that you're actually responding to my questions. So I think uh, just a little effort like this goes a long way. And I, you know, I don't know that this is going to be the answer for everybody, like I said, we're really just experimenting with it right now and we're going to see how scalable it is. But the important thing is that we're removing communication barriers and making it easier for developers to get their questions answered. The overview, um, you know, these fundamentals that we talked about, there's there's a few different things. We covered how you're going to build your product. So it's the importance of advocating for developers. And uh, remember, this is the most important item on the list because everything else depends on it. If you're not advocating for these other uh, these other things to be part of your product, then you know it's just not going to happen, and you're going to have a poor developer experience. So, so this one's number one for me. Uh, next is what you're going to build. 
And, uh, you know, above all else, the product, it needs to be consistent and reliable. It needs to be oddly satisfying. And uh, to get to that point, you know, I, I think it's important to get feedback from your developer audience to help shape that product. And last, after the product is done, it's time to communicate with your developers, teach them how to use it, engage with them, answer their questions, remove communication barriers, and make sure that they have a you know a great experience using your product and so and so that's really it those are those are the fundamentals i'm happy to uh continue the conversation if you have you know any questions for me or any suggestions about things that have worked for you that you think that we could maybe use at galileo i'm all ears um so uh, yeah i mean feel free to reach out to me there's my there's my twitter handle and uh thank you so much